Good afternoon, and welcome to our second in the series of the uh, NAACP midterm elections. We are talking about the importance of midterm elections and what it means, what your vote means. With us is Willie Wilson, Jr., who is going to be our facilitator this afternoon. He will talk to us about the uh, ballot questions. He will address the issues, and he will help us become informed citizens. Uh, Willie is a former educator. Uh, he has worked, uh, is currently an adjunct professor at Stonehill, has worked at Harvard, uh, and is well known uh, in Brockton. We are excited to have him here for the second series, uh, and we welcome here to the Brockton Area Branch Forum. Uh, welcome, Willie Wilson. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here again for the second of uh, this two-part series on the importance of midterm elections. And as the, uh, the committee was debating and formulating ideas as to the format of this particular one, they, they decided that um, the, the best uh, use of our time would be to address the three ballot questions. And so uh, we're here um, to actually talk about the three ballot questions and, uh, and also to engage the audience with their uh, concerns. Um, we have uh, members of the committee here, as well as uh, another member, Mr. Thomasy, who will, will also uh, add uh, another educator who has taught U.S. history and currently teaches in Needham at a private school. And so I'm looking forward to getting going. I, I just want to say again, I'm the facilitator. I am not the specialist. I am, I am not uh, Mr. Know-it-all. And so, uh, but I, and it's uh, just wonderful to um, join you in this learning, um, in, in this learning process. So, uh, uh, Steve, would you come up? Hello. <laughs> uh, now. Uh, the question was posed, what are the midterm elections and why are they important? Even though we, and we talked about that in the first, uh, the first presentation. And, um, and I thought maybe again to just uh, refresh people's minds, if you could um, answer that question, why are midterm elections, what are midterm elections and why are they important? I, you know, I was thinking about this, um, uh, particularly in this organization, mm -hmm. Uh, everybody here probably looks like people old enough to have voted for Barack Obama, and you can remember that night in November of 2008 how excited you were when Barack Obama <laughs> got elected. I mean, I was down at Tampu, and I was like, so juiced. It was wonderful. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so juiced. <laughs> I think Judge Kavanaugh used that phrase. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, anyway um, Obama came in, as you remember, he was uh, uh, faced with the biggest economic downturn since the Great Depression, and he proposed legislation that uh, regulated banks and this sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Almost everything he got through uh, narrowly got through a Democratic-controlled Congress. He also, uh, his signature issue was the Affordable Cal Health Care Act, which he also narrowly got through a Democratic Congress. Two years later, exactly two years later, in November of 2010, there were the midterm elections. Um, at that point, the Republicans took both houses of Congress, and for the next six years, uh, Obama had to fight essentially a rear guard action. Anything that he accomplished had to be done by executive action, or he could veto Republican passed uh, legislation, and and uh, it it couldn't you know they didn't have the votes to override his veto. But his presidency for the last six years was hamstrung by the fact that uh, the exact okay let me just statistically this is actually true if the exact same people who had voted for Barack Obama, the exact people, no more, no less, exact people who had voted for Barack Obama in November of 2008 had come out in November of 2010, 
and voted for congressmen who said they were going to support Obama's legislation, then the Democrats would have had both houses and Obama would have been a, his presidency would have been far more successful. Not just inspirational, but it would have had a lot more achievements. And, you know, you look at that and you, and you have to explain, I mean, I, I teach political science, I do this stuff all the time, I teach government and talk about this. Um, if you look at why uh, Obama inspired young people and people of color who had never voted before to come out in, in 2010 when he was not on the ballot, right, they didn't have the same motivation. And I know he campaigned out there and was in many places and telling people the exact same thing. If you came vote for me, you got to do this. But it didn't, it didn't work. So the midterm elections, now, whoever wins also, uh, you know, the Constitution says that the Congress has two functions. One is to legislate, but the other is oversight. So that's why you have all of these committees you know, that, that have particular functions. So now you're seeing the Senate Judiciary Committee. The reason that it may not be Kavanaugh, but another Republican judge is going to fly through next, is that they have the majority there. That's decided in midterm elections. So uh, it's not just the presidential elections that are uh, important. These are co-equally important, but they are less well-noted, public media and all this sort of thing. I, and I just want to say... I want to underscore the 1940s, uh, there was a song, Praise the Lord and Pass the Ammunition. Mm. And the last line of that song said, Praise the Lord, Pass the Ammunition, and we all will be free. And, and, and I want to use that line as a metaphor because people think that by voting in one election, it, as historic as it was with President Obama, that that's enough. D democracy is a continuous process. And what happens is when you praise the Lord, pass the ammunition, and we'll all be free. The ammunition is the ballot box. It's political involvement. Like we have local uh, congressmen and women, city councilors. You, you, as a citizen, it's incumbent upon me to support them, to let, me, let them know what I'm feeling. And, and average citizens do not do that. They do not do that. And so the, what I'm saying is I, I think it, once you engage young people, it has to be a constant engagement. You can't just vote once and feel the job is over. And, and unfortunately, even people our age have missed out on midterms. Just the last election here in the Commonwealth, you know, some people didn't vote. And I said, aren't you going? Oh, no. You know, and it, you can't take that attitude. You have to be forever vigilant. Because what happens is there's an erosion of rights, you know, and uh, that happens when the opposite party. I think one of the problems is the partisanship has 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 been so strong. In the past, whether you were Democrat, Republican, or Independent, there was this feeling that we could come together, there would be consensus, and all Americans would benefit. Now we have a party line. This is one of the reasons why some of the founding fathers were against political parties in the first place, because they felt that they, the party would be more important than the actual benefits of the average citizen. That, the, the thing about that, that was a great poem there, because uh, I remember when Obama was running, and you remember the hope signs. Everything was the hope. And I, I thought, I mean, it, you want to do what you can to get elected, but I thought he was a bit oversold. It was almost like Obama's going to come and save us. He's like Jesus. And the answer was that you have to save yourself. I was talking to people after this. you got to save yourself. You can't expect Obama to save you. Um, the partisanship business, you know, we, we talk about this all the time. You know, Washington famously is against partisanship and all that sort of thing. I don't think that's avoidable. I think party is just a name for interest groups. People who are like-minded, like us here, uh, get together and form groups, and then they name themselves, and that, in effect, is a party. I don't know that that's that's possible. Um, you know, when we get to this, when we get to this third ballot, um, it's really interesting. I think it's kind of vague, and I don't think people much know what they're voting for, but. This ballot is in reaction, it's, it's a few years ago, to the uh, Citizens 
uh, United case, you know, and and um, everything is highly partisan. Uh, that that was a you know a case where people were favoring one party than the other, and it's interesting. The Citizen United case was a Supreme Court case that overturned McCain-Feingold, which was a wonderful example, maybe the last really strong example that I can think of, of a bipartisan effort. It was, you know, John McCain, Republican, and Russ Feingold, the Democratic senator from Wisconsin, and, and they got a, a large majority, and George Bush signed that legislation with enthusiasm. And then it was overturned in, in the Supreme Court, you know, on the basis of freedom of speech and that sort of thing. And I can't think of anything. That was back in 2004. And I, in my night school class, I would show the kids this film on how legislation is made. And the example that they gave in this, this thing comes out of Annenberg uh, Foundation, the example that they gave was showing the McCain-Feingold and getting this through, and trading this and that interest in order to get enough votes, et cetera. And I show it to them, and then I have to say, well, <laughs> well, that's gone now. We only have Citizens United, which <coughs> embeds partisanship, you know, as, as part of the political practice, and I feel so sad. But I, well, we wanna, what I want to do is, since he mentioned it, there are three ballot questions because we decided, the committee decided to focus on the ballot questions. So since you mentioned that, that's, that's ballot question number two. Uh, uh, basically, it's a proposed law that would create a citizens commission to consider and recommend potential amendments to the United States Constitution to establish that corporations do not have the same constitutional rights as human beings and that campaign contributions and expenditures may be regulated. Uh, a yes vote would create a citizens commission to advance an amendment to the United States Constitution to limit the influence of money in elections and establish that corporations do not have the same rights as human beings. A no vote would not create the commission. And, uh, and so that's, that's ballot question number two. Ballot question number one uh, is patient to nurse limits. The proposed law would limit how many patients could be assigned to each registered nurse in Massachusetts hospitals and certain other healthcare facilities. The maximum number of patients per registered nurse would vary by type of unit and level of care. Uh, and again, what happens is a yes vote would limit the number of patients that could be assigned to one registered nurse in hospitals and certain other uh, health care facilities. A no vote would make no change in current laws relative to patient to nurse limits. And the third uh, ballot question is one that deals with um, the transgender anti-discrimination. And this is the one where a lot of people were very confused and the, the summary is a little longer than the other two. This law adds gender identity to the list of prohibited grounds for discrimination in places of public accommodation, resort, or amusement. Such grounds also include race, color, religious creed, national origin, sex, disability, and ancestry. A place of public accommodation, resort, or amusement is defined in existing law as any place that is open to and accepts or solicits the patronage of the general public, such as hotels, stores, restaurants, theaters, sports facilities, and hospitals. Gender identity is defined as a person's sincerely held gender-related identity, appearance, or behavior. Whether or not it is different from that, of, of traditional, traditionally associated with the person's physiology or assigned sex at birth. Now, this one is a little, uh, you know, again, the explanation, uh, you know, goes into detail, but a yes vote would keep in place the current law which prohibits discrimination on the basis of gender identity in places of public accommodation. A no vote would repeal this re provision of the public accommodation law. And so these are the three ballot questions, uh, and I'm, I'm glad we have in our, uh, in our audience today, we have uh, uh, members of the state legislature here. But uh, again, 
one of the things I do want to say is there would have been more questions on the, the ballot, but uh, the legislature actually uh, uh, had a meeting and they were able to address some other issues via legislation so we don't have as many. Um, and one of those dealt with uh, the millionaire's um, uh, tax and so forth. Uh, but those are the three ballot questions that are on, and, it, and it's really wonderful, uh, as most of us are residents of Massachusetts, having the oldest constitution on which the federal constitution is based, uh, and yet we have this process with the ballot questions. So the midterms elections are important, and the ballot questions are important as any other the referendum because it allows us to engage directly into uh, in, in terms of public law. With that said. Yeah, I, I don't know which ones we should discuss here. I, 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 we have the page, both of us, like open to the uh, transgender thing. Um, just, a, you know, I, there are a pro and con side here. So, you know, I would tell you my point of view, and I feel a little guilty about that because there isn't somebody that would tell the opposite. What's interesting about the Transgender Anti-Discrimination Act is that it's a vote not on whether to uh, grant people civil rights. It's a vote on whether to take away civil rights that already are in law. I find this just stunning. Um, in, in history, you know, teaching history will really, tell you one of the things you do is analogous thinking. This is like this. So you take something that you don't understand and com compare it to something that you do understand to enhance your understanding of what you don't. And so in this case, I look at this and, and you think, I mean, in this setting with the NAACP, this is a removal of rights that are, you know, in, you already have by law. And you can think of it now, and, and one of the problems with this transgender thing, because I've been watching stuff on TV like Greater Boston and stuff that, you know, for and against, and um, people are, you know, I guess frightened by that which they are not frightened, essentially, by transgender. And people are so different than them, and then you're fearful. And if, if you also include the sex question, it really makes it powerful. And I, you know, I think about uh, you know, Jim Crow days and, and what were the justifications to keep people of color you know, without rights? And it was um, that they were so different and that when you put in the sex business, you know, that these people can defile the white women or whatever. When you put that in, it, it put this new, like, element of emotion in it. And I just look at this and I think, well, we, we, how many people are... Well, we have to, we yeah. want to be yeah. fair. Yeah. Yes. So, usually a law comes on um, question, a referendum question like that. It has to be a history of how this became a question, right? So... You, you have a, that's an excellent, yeah. right, repeat the question. Okay. Oh, yeah. Well, uh, well, first of all, I, you know, the, uh, essentially what she is saying is how, you know, because how did this come, you know, we have current law, how did this law come into being? What incident spurred this? And, and I'm, I, I'm not certain, but I want to read you, the current law we have, a vote yes is in favor of the current law. Let me tell you what the people who are against it, the opponents say. Voting no repeals the bathroom bill law and prevents men from entering women's bathrooms, locker rooms, dressing rooms, and intimate spaces. The law violates the privacy and safety of women by allowing any man identifying as a woman, including convicted sex offenders, to share women's facilities. 
Under the law, any attempt to block a man from entering a woman's locker room, dressing room, or bathroom could result in individual penalties of up to $50,000 and a year in prison. Businesses are also affected, like a female spa owner who faced a discrimination claim for declining to wax the genitals of a man identifying as a woman. No law should make uh, women and girls feel unsafe and exploit their privacy and security. The Massachusetts legislature passed a law that goes too far, even refusing to include a provision to exclude convicted sex offenders. A no vote protects women's privacy and safety. So what has happened is one of those things has occurred. Now, the current law is supported by law enforcement, Massachusetts Chiefs of Police, Massachusetts uh, major city uh, chiefs of police, women's organizations, and uh, Massachusetts Parent Teachers Association and others. So the current law exists, but you raise a good point. What has happened, and I'm wondering how that specific incident was adjudicated, because that's, that's it. But, but here's the thing. I don't remember. I want to tell you. I, I, I don't remember what you, you raise a point, and I don't remember, to my knowledge, any incident that has come to the fore. So that's why I, I don't know. Uh, what, do, do you know this? Did this happen in Seattle, this particular Seattle? event? Uh, here, oh. this didn't happen in Massachusetts, the one that is cited here about the... Waxing genitals. of the genitals. Yeah. See, I think it, it could have been... They, as a, they looked at other states and they brought a case in, because I don't know of any case, Claire, maybe you can help me, I don't know of any case that's occurred here. Well, we can repeat what you said, yeah. Mm -hmm. There is no single documented case in Massachusetts of this happening. Thank you. There are some communities, uh, for instance, I believe uh, Cambridge uh, has had this on the book for 20 plus years, and there has never been an incident. Uh, so when we look to speak to discrimination, <clears throat> this law says you cannot discriminate a person against a person based on their Thank you. State Representative Cronin, can you just clarify something? What had happened with the uh, several of the ministerial alliances across the Commonwealth, their concern was that the law has extended, and I think it may have some of the more conservative groups may have uh, sued Attorney General Healy on this, but with respect to public accommodations, does this law include houses of worship? That's not a question. Because that, I think that was a lot of pushback from clergy across Massachusetts, that it included houses of worship. I, I believe there's a lot of misinformation okay. being spread. Because um, I've never, on the law, it doesn't say, it, it doesn't mention houses of worship. Well, I don't know. That's a good question, though. <laughs> it, it seems that some of the questions surrounding the, 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 the fear of the, the transgender bill is also built upon uh, sex offenders. I hear that word mm -hmm. utilized a lot. A lot. Um, wouldn't it be easier to address that in a legislative uh, body um, that would prohibit uh, sex offenders from, you know, it, it would make this, you know. Prohibit sex um, offenders from, from committing yeah. other crimes. I mean, the, if the worry is the sex offenders are going to suddenly become sex offenders more, I guess, if they're allowed to go into different bathrooms, I mean, 
Yeah, I know I see that, but is, is a sex offender going to go through the whole process of transgender identification and all that in order to be able to legally go into somebody else's yeah. bathroom? It's, it's an absurdity. Yeah, it's just but, but absurdity. that's what they, but that's how, this is the, their argument. Yeah. It, it seems like a big stretch to, to go through yeah. all of that, you know, when there are many opportunities, probably as a sex offender, outside that realm to, yeah. to do what they... They, they do. So but I think, that, you know, what, uh, what uh, Claire had said is the fear. See, that's the, the first sentence says, voting no repeals the bathroom and prevents men from entering women's bathrooms. See, that's the, that, so you're, you're getting that voter who's on the fence and you're saying, yeah, he can come right in and you, while you're in the bathroom. See, and it's, 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 it's actually the way it's worded, it's, it's trying to get it's emoting, trying to get yeah. people to say, yeah, right. as opposed to, right. you know, a sane, rational response. And did they, did they have, does, do we know if anyone looked at the data from Cambridge? Because like it was said, Cambridge has had a municipal law ordinance in effect for 20 plus years. So if they haven't had, if there are police room narratives and stuff that have not indicated that this is an issue, it's a non-issue. It's a non-issue. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what about the, uh, the other two? Uh, well, we talked about the second one. Um, we talked about uh, ballot question number three. Number Just one. number one is okay. the one we haven't discussed right. yeah. in terms of the nurses. <coughs> yeah. uh, and uh, again, uh, this one, I know that this, they passed this law. They've had this law for several years now in the state of California, and it works. And so... Uh, Does it? Yes. yes. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Data, yeah, I, I, no, hands I, I, down. I if you, all you have to do is look at the data. I think. I think. I, I don't think this is the exact law that the state of California has. It's very. It, it's. It I would say ninety-five percent. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. So, for for those of us that come from a healthcare background, we all know that acuity, acuity is very very important in terms of staffing, mm -hmm. especially whether it's a licensed nurse or a PCA. I know Janet's in the room. She can help speak to this. So for me, it is my concern is, is that if you telling a nurse that she can only have a certain amount of patients, to me, just kind of disregards acuity, uh, especially when we have uh, a no diversion law that was enacted, I think, four or five years ago here in the Commonwealth, where you can't divert ambulances to, from emergency rooms. Uh, so I, I think it's it's a it's an interesting law. But I, I like to hear what a well, nurse manager. Actually, I like to hear what a nurse manager has to say. Well, <laughs> having worked in pretty much all areas in the ER and the ICU and, and med surge, you know, uh -huh. and outpatient, you know, it, it's so dependent on what area you're in. You right. Know, like when a particular I went to the discipline. ICU with a really sick patient. ICUs are exempt, though, right? What is really? This? ICUs are exempt, though. I. I uh, I haven't heard that, I I haven't heard that either. Mm. I, I don't think they're exempt. No. I oh. think that it, it's, it's the max is the four or five patients, but in areas where the patients are sicker, you know, they would obviously have less than that. Is what yeah. from oh, what I, thought I understand. It, I thought the ICUs were definitely exempt from the law because no. no. we know that no. you have to have a one-to-one -one ratio with, with RPNs. I don't, I don't, I don't know of that. I don't know that, but oh, that's but this let me, let me, has been let me, utilized in. The, uh, it's currently utilized in the pediatric uh, units right. now without any problem. Right. One, mm -hmm. one to one. Yeah. Uh, the current law, the proposed law change right. now one has one. actually been in uh, pediatric and, uh, and ICUs, it's, and it's also yeah. been in certain hospitals. So, but it's not statewide. Right. I do want to read. Uh, there's a there's a statement of fiscal consequences. So the, uh, the proposed law may affect both state and municipal revenues and expenditures with state-owned hospitals required to expend between an estimated $67 uh, million to $74 million annually to comply with the proposed law. This is, this is the, uh, uh, the co fiscal consequences. Mm -hmm. And the Health Policy Commission required to expend it uh, one million two hundred eighty-seven thousand eighty-one thousand dollars annually to monitor compliance. There will be. There's also. Uh, there will also be an impact on Mass Health, the state's Medicaid program, and state-funded employee and retire, retiree health care obligations to the extent that the initiative increases 
hospital causes, costs, or causes hospital closures. The overall fiscal consequences to the state and municipal finances, however, are difficult to project due to the lack of reliable data. Right, right. You know, so on, the on, the, on reliable data on the cost. Okay, so let me just, I just want to clear up something. So the, in an ICU, it's always one nurse for one patient. So this law doesn't change that, right? Right, right, right. right. It change right. It. right. It's just so a minimum. For, right. This, this, yeah. So, but what this law does, it brings it into general other modalities. So it'll bring it into med surge, it'll bring it into oncology, it'll bring it into general beds. That it'll be one nurse for one patient? It's not about Well, hey, listen, 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 wait a minute, let me, let me, let me, listen. This initiative establishes a safe maximum for limit for the number of patients assigned to nurses in all hospital areas to ensure our yeah. patients receive the care and attention they need. It provides maximum flexibility requiring hospitals to adjust registered nurse staffing yeah. levels based on the needs of patients and does so without reducing other members of the healthcare workforce. Okay? Does it mention acuity? No, there's no mention of, there's acuity. No mention of acuity. But let, let me talk about the, those who are against it. Uh, you know, that those who are against it say that... Uh, Massachusetts hospitals rank among the best in the nation, but question one will put the patient care quality and safety at risk. It forces rigid government-imposed nurse staffing ratios at every hospital, overriding the professional judgment of nurses and doctors. That's hospital administration. Yeah, this is the, yeah, that's, this, this, is the, uh, this is the opposite side. Yeah. Uh, question one, they said, would create massive unfunded government mandate costing more than $1 billion in higher health care costs annually, causing community hospitals to close and forcing others to reduce emergency addiction and behavioral health services. Mm -hmm. Question one, uh, you know, this is what they're saying. That's, the, that's yeah. their yeah. argument. Uh, higher costs, rigid mandates, one size fits all health care. And, and so that's the opposite as to those who believe that, in fact, it, it would be um, a benefit. Now, the data from California does show that, and it's 95%, that, that's another thing, 86% of the nurses here in the Commonwealth agree with yes. yes. on. Yes. So the, the, the no vote are some nurses who've been co-opted co by uh, administrative... Uh, you don't think this is job security for nursing? Uh, I, well, I don't, I, I, you know, I think it is, but, I, but I'm just saying yeah. that... It's the administration, it's the admini uh, hospital administrators and that are, they reined in some nurses to support them. 86% of the rank and file nurses are in favor of a yes, no, of a yes vote. And, and I just wanted to say that the few nurses that are voting no, what they're saying is that we should have the right to dictate and to decide how many how many patients that we care for and clearly i i agree with that to some extent but there's more to it than that right. so why can't that be a part, part of the collective bargaining for those nurses that are unionized here in the commonwealth mm -hmm. really seriously why does they, why why does there have to be a legislative involvement or the involvement of uh, these well, sort of uh, it doesn't work that way nurses don't decide it hospital administration decides that, not not that. not in union shops like brigham and women's i disagree Brigham Women's is a union shop. They can, they, this can be a part of the collective bargaining. Oh, my, my wife is in m and and she's in the, involved in the collective bargaining at Newton Wellesley Hospital. And the idea that the nurses can set their, their own rules is not true. These days in this country, what unions do is fight rear guard actions to keep the takeaways Generally. from happening. Generally. So yeah. they really don't have that kind of thing. What you have. need is the support of something like this to back them up. All this talks about is the maximum amount that a nurse has to have. So you can't give her more than that. The other side is saying things like, oh, there's a nursing shortage. One of the reasons there's a nursing shortage is that nurses don't want to take on these excessive workloads that they have. So they go into other fields, or they go down in the south, or they go to 
work in medical buildings where they're not actually doing patient care in a hospital? Over requiring nurses to obtain so, so this type of you know, law bachelor's right? degrees that they didn't have to previously attain. Right. So okay. this type of law right now only exists in California, or is there is there somewhere else? I, I, the only other state that I know where it exists is, is California. But I do want to mention something else. It 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 does even CNA certified nursing assistants and others uh, feel that this is going to help elevate the standard of care for That's patients. Yeah. And I have to, as a as a uh, educator, and having nurses in my family, and and all of them have said that they, uh, it's a yes vote for the same reasons that Mr. Thomas had mentioned. They, it, it's going to bring up a level where they can even have further decisions in, the, in terms of input into the health care of, the, of uh, uh, daughter, people in the state. My daughter's a nurse. Um, What's she saying? She said, safe patient care means safe patient ratios. Do Correct. you agree? Now, one of the things you should realize is before California, one of the, the things that they don't talk about, the number of accidents and mistakes due to uh, uh, patient caseload, they have dropped. If you, that's why I say if you look at the data in terms of the state of California, they've dropped precipitously and they have shown they, this data hardcore. You can't argue with the facts. I'm not Trump. I'm talking about real facts <laughs> that that you can see you can actually see patient care in terms of how it is it's, as it has improved and then I think that's the reason why I think you have 86 percent of the nurses who are in favor of it. Yes. So, the, the reality safety is, is they want yeah. safe patient care. I mean, well, they the safety, they should say right. that about California though. Hmm? They say, they should, they, but they well, they you they know what they they can't say that. They can't say that about California because the safety ratio or the safety issues in the Commonwealth are probably just as low. So you're not implying that there are safety issues here in the Commonwealth with respect. No, to I'm just you. saying that that there's going to be greater I'm improvement. I'm just keeping the debate going. Yeah, yeah, I, I see. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, guys. Nurses are overworked. Yes. And have too They're many tired. patients. Right. You have safety issues. Right. My sister was a nurse for 40 years. It's hard, and the doctors get all the money. Okay. Oh, yeah. So oh, we don't want they to know. Do, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nurses do all the work. Nurses yeah. do all the work. Yeah. And doctors yeah. Now, now you know. Now, now your sister, but your right. sister practiced. In North Carolina, right? But she started in New York at Harlem Hospital. Okay, all right. Yeah. Okay. Amen. All right. All right. Okay. So, but what I'm okay. saying, I think it's, it's, it's an issue that we need to look at because most of the nurses that I know, even today, work 12 hour shifts. That's true. Yeah. That's mm -hmm. hard. Yeah, 12 hours. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of an inordinate amount of patients. We most of them choose that. I mean, no, I know. That's 12, 12 four, is, yeah. four, 12 is the standard. Yeah, I mean, you're not forced to do that, but a lot of, a lot of nurses do work 12, no, 12 hours, sure. especially in the big hospitals. Yeah. 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 So the question about, the, 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 issue, the thing about these ballot questions, one of the things that people have said, especially a lot of young people that I've heard across the Commonwealth, they say that the ballot questions matter to a certain degree, that the legislator can just turn around and just change everything as they did with um, the sales ta uh, the, the sales tax law. no the not the millionaire sales tax we did that I knew that was that was unconstitutional the no, no no the, no there was a sales tax the reduction sales tax. Yeah. Yeah. Sales tax reduction oh yeah yeah that one that one yeah so if they can if they let not no no you know no push at our, our great team here but if they can if the citizens say this is what we want and the legislators can come and change that why waste our time on ballot questions. No, they don't actually change it. What they do is not implement no, it. Implement it or not. So that just is worse? Isn't well, it? Well, no, no, it's not changing. I mean, what, no, no. You wait, have to wait, wait. In, in the difference, explain doing. the yeah. difference between binding in terms of the right, referendum right. and non-binding. Binding. Yeah. yeah. So, but you're saying, really, that, that nurses generally feel that their power will be increased or their um, status, say, of right. prestige by implementing something like this. Right. Correct? This is... This is that's what they're saying. Eighty-six percent of the nurses are saying, and they and, and these these nurses, they, I mean, it's it, it's not by accident that we have uh, the best medical care, and and that we have, you know, a state system in terms. We had the Affordable Care Act before it was federalized, you know. But what they're saying, this is logically another step to ensure 
that we maintain that kid. So we because so because exactly and and the reason why they're so proactive is because of the aging population of the nation. So as many and, and, you know we call it aging in place. Right. So they right. want this in place so they can continue to provide the high standard of care that they've been doing. And tell the community, so what will happen if, 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 if it fails? Oh, I, Are we going to have a lot of deaths? Oh, I, I, well, I, uh, I don't know. That's a good no. question. I'd, 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 I'd have to defer to a nurse. I don't think so either. I don't think so either Do because we know how much money has been spent so far on the no campaign. Oh, and, and you know what? I'm glad you raised that question. The question was, do we know how much money has been spent by the the no campaign? And oh. I I we I don't know. And I'm wondering how much of that money is out of state. It is interesting that that when you when I look at that commercial, the the one uh, against the ballot initiative. They say the patients will be hurt, and I'm thinking, I, you know, I was mentioning my mother's been in the hospital 11 times this year, and I'm down there, and I'm thinking, the patient's going to be hurt by better nursing care? I don't see that one. And the other thing, though, to show you that it, it is out-of-state money and stuff, the, the line about government intervention, I mean, this anti-socialism kind of thing that's been going on since World War II, McCarthyism and everything, that kind of idea that government bureaucrats are somehow going to set your your patient limits and stuff that's a that's another emotional uh, hook it's you know it's not it's not reasonable all they're saying is oh you're a patient you're going to get better care my wife comes home every day and i hear story after story about how they give her more to do more to do more to do these consultants are hired she works for partners you know giant Oh, yeah. An organization that's making money hand over fist, they they send out consultants oh, yeah. time oh, yeah. and whatever time and uh, what is it time and motion mm -hmm. consultants mm -hmm. yeah. to talk about this. So, for example, she does uh, one of the major things she does is uh, pretest interviews. She used to get thirty minutes. Some time these consultants came who are not medical people. They're hired, you know, for, as consultant firms. And they said, okay, you can do it in 20, right? You can do it in 20. So she went from 30 to 20 for the exact same task. And, you know, you can't do it. Now, right. some patients you can do it if there's no complications, right. but you right. call right. an old man who has 45 medications and you try to have him explain and get this done in the 30 minutes. It's, I mean, I'm just saying that this kind of thing. And, and the other side is motivated. I mean, the nurses they have on those things are nurse managers. They're part of the administration, and you know they're part of the idea that this is a very lucrative industry being in, you know involved. But it's but for the nurses, you know, and a lot of the nurses, particularly. I mean, I only know older nurses, but I look at my my niece, one niece who went down to South Carolina, and my my um, um, nephew's girlfriend who has just left nursing down at the Brigham, and she's gonna go work as a, like, a nurse consultant for a corporation. Much easier jobs. The mm. patient care, the actual touch the patient in mm. the bed is becoming harder and harder and harder, and they're asking them to do impossible tasks. So, I, you know, it's just, you know, it's like money against the patients. Increasingly yeah. high tech. Equipment. Oh yeah, you know about Epic, like when they change yeah. all the computers yeah. every day. Every yeah. week they come in with a new computer program that the nurses have to learn <coughs> on the run yeah. while they're also doing more work than they can possibly do in the time allotted. And they say, okay, here's a new computer program because our consultants said that this will <laughs> be better. For who? I don't know. We've actually seen this happen a little bit in the pharmaceutical business with pharmacists. You know, they had consultants that would come in and say, you, uh, you can write so many scripts in such and such a time. And what you found was now the, the care, you don't see, the pharmacists aren't doing as much as they used to be. They're doing more. But what they used to do is different than what they're doing now because it's been relayed to a pharmacy tech. And a pharmacy tech, for better or for worse, is, can be an 18-year-old kid who takes six months training and is now dispensing medication. Right. And it's, it's a dangerous precedent we're setting where we're going to end up relying on CNAs, for better or for worse, to 
provide patient care. And I and, and, I, and I think that's not good. And you know what? And I I'm glad you mentioned that because um, the CNAs, you know, mm. I I teach CNAs. So the, the what's going to happen is, you know, you're going to have the the what they're now required to do, even in terms of training. Is more and more, and yet the pay is still low. Pay is you beyond know. paltry. And and, and 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 also, that's an area. I know one CNA. Uh, she had was was upset when we did the we did a series on immigration, and she, and she said to me, she said, Mr. Wilson, what bothers me is even though I'm qualified, and I and I have great credentials. When I go to a patient because of my accent, mm. I'm received differently than my my white uh, counterparts, yeah. and so you know that's that's a whole nother level in terms of interaction and so forth. So, but this I think this is very good. I mean, um, as Bevan and I we we worked about you know the valid questions and and I and we you know there are three questions. I'm glad there were only three. You know, uh, but uh, but what happens is. They, they really, it, it's another reason why you, one should stay involved in the actual midterm election process. And I, I like what you said, uh, Tony, about uh, young people, even though they're saying, well, these ballot questions, are, but if they were involved in the political process, they could see how important this is for their parents or grandparents or aunts. You know, so even when there's an right, issue right. that doesn't relate to you from an age set uh, perspective, the, the whole thing is, as a community, as the city of Brockton, as the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, as the United States of America, these issues are important. But it's one of the things that you said, and I think is very important, is that, and I think you pick back up, it seems to be a one-time thing for some of the young people. Obama's running for president. Yeah, we'll support Obama. But then after that, the municipal election, statewide stuff, mm -hmm. they're not participating. So how do we energize them? Really, how do you energize them? That's the that's the that's I mean, the they, they, they look for a superstar like Obama. Quite frankly, a lot of us are not. I mean, we know we know our stuff, but we're not superstars like Obama. And and, and the other thing is, let it begin. The, it's the individuals now. And, and President Obama was a good president, yeah. and he did actually engage people. But it's it starts with you as a citizen. Yeah. You know, yeah. you yeah. have to be involved. Yeah. You know, you you have to start thinking about more than yourself. Yeah. What do you want your neighborhood to look like? What do you want your city to look like? You know. Many of you have said Massachusetts is a beacon of medical care. It is. Yes. As is California, I'm sure. But, I mean, people look to us. So as Massachusetts goes, probably other people are going to go. So that's why it's critical for nurses to support this. And I bet that's the case with some of the money coming in because we, we're a bellwether. And so that the money for the no votes, I bet there, it, it could be uh, insurance companies, um, you know, and, and others looking at if this, if they have it in California, if Massachusetts, you know, this is going to mean a loss of profits for our, for our board members. So they, and they, if you trace the money, that's why that was a good question. Trace, where's that money coming from to support the no vote? Uh, constitutional amendments are extremely difficult to pass. Uh, they were designed that way when they wrote mm -hmm, the Constitution. Mm -hmm in order so that people wouldn't respond emotionally to some issue of the moment. There's been uh, 17 of them since 1791, only 17, and that's 227 years. So it's a really circuitous process. This law here actually is only people approving or disapproving indirectly of Citizens United. It calls for Massachusetts, this would be federal legislators to support a constitutional convention uh, designed to pass a 28th Amendment. Uh, there's never been a constitutional convention, even though it's, it's legally allowed, since the original constitutional convention. So it's a really circuitous process. But what's interesting is the um, a Supreme Court decision can only be overturned in two ways. One is by a later Supreme Court decision, so like Brown versus mm -hmm. Board overturns Plessy versus Ferguson, that sort of thing. The other way 
is to pass a constitutional amendment to change the Constitution, and that'll override a Supreme Court decision. Uh, just for, <laughs> if you're into the details, that's happened three times only, the 11th, 14th, and, and um, ooh, sorry, the, the amendment for the, the uh, income tax, federal income tax, the original Constitution uh, specifically prohibited a per capita income tax, so there was no federal income tax until 1913. So they had to pass a constitutional amendment. They had tried it legislatively to get an income tax, but they had lost in the Supreme Court. So they had to pass a constitutional <coughs> amendment. Those are the only three times. It's a very difficult process here. So this is just the people that put this on want the people of Massachusetts to register their discontent mm with Citizens United and, and, and that type of attitude where there is money that doesn't have to be accounted for anymore. Now actually, technically, I think in Citizens United, you have to account for it, but not until after the election is over. So the door is already closed and you can find out where the money is. And, and, and to uh, piggyback on your point, those in favor say the Supreme Court says that the laws limiting political spending violate the First Amendment. Most Americans know this is incorrect. Money is not speech. It is power, and concentrated power requires checks and balances. 75% of Americans, including liberals and conservatives, <clears throat> support this amendment to correct the court with 19 states and over 200 Massachusetts communities formally calling for it. This measure creates a nonpartisan, unpaid citizens commission to be the people's advocate for this amendment, with commissioners serving at no cost to the taxpayers. There are 351 cities and towns in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts and, and uh, over 200 uh, calling for it. So we do have some communities that are for it. You know, when you look at uh, a map, mm -hmm. so there's some fiscally uh, politically conservative communities, but in general, over 200 communities. And what he says is true. It's going to be, it's, it's a fight, but what's good is if we get a yes vote, now we can build in. Because that dark money, it really, really hurts the democratic process. You know, we're trying to get young people and others who haven't been voting to vote, and, and we want them to vote on a consistent basis. And, and that dark money really just it's a cloud. Can I ask, have, oh, but, uh, sorry. but haven't we really had, you know, one shape or form dark money all along for, for, for quite some time? I would use the analogy of, of unions. You know, you get a union endorsement and then they pile tons of money into a candidate's advertising and such. So, well, no, I mean, I mean, there used to be the PAC money. You remember when Al right, Gore got right, in yeah, trouble. Yeah for taking PAC money during the 1996 election. He was, and he had to like apologize and get on TV and stuff like this. The difference was the question of accountability, when it has to be declared where your source mm. of money is from. Under Citizens United, you don't have to declare where it's from until after the election's yeah. been, been held. So people who are voting can't make a judgment on where the money comes from because they until don't after, after the election is, is held. That's that's the thing. One of the more interesting things I've just read for the first time the the against, the people that wanna maintain it and it's just a small thing. It's from Mass Massachusetts Fiscal Alliance. Oh, yeah. you know them very well. And basically if you read this and I'm not gonna read it to you, it says Citizens United is good because it Protects your freedom yeah, they of actually, speech. actually come up, yeah. It actually says Citizens United is good. I mean, those words right here. And see, that's what's confusing for the average citizen. They, you know, that's why I love this, the, the booklet that um, Secretary Galvin puts out is because it tells you what a yes vote and a no vote is. Right. But, you know, he lays it all out there. How many citizens read, read it? it? Right. So right. you can really tell the difference, you know, as opposed to just listening to a, a television ad, you know. So can, you, can I ask a, uh, maybe a basic or ridiculous question? I know there's some lawyers in here. Why can't they just, the, uh, uh, the Congress, go in and say, we want the money to be known at the time that it is given? So they can't do that without us going through this 
big a change. Oh, congressional sorry. legislation can't overturn the Supreme period, Court. Period. Yeah. So there's no way around that. No. 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 Right. Well, can I answer that? Isn't it Congress that wants to get these donations? Touche. <laughs> <laughs> Exactly. Right. No, yeah, and that's a really good thing. But you got to remember, McCain Feingold actually that was bipartisan. Happened. That was yeah. bipartisan. It was extraordinary. It was yeah. one of the best cases ever, and it was shot down by the Supreme Court. And that's the way that's it works. what that's what people don't realize. That wonderful piece of legislation was shot down instead of right. giving them an opportunity to amend it. You know, they shot it down, and that all that dark money came in. How are we doing on time? Yeah, okay. we're going to wrap it up. Wrap it up. Yeah. Okay. We covered all the questions, right? Yep, okay. we did. Okay. Um, any more questions from anyone? I, if I, I just, I apologize. I'm in the middle of knocking on doors and so forth. I want to stop by quickly. Uh, any help I can be moving forward or at a future meeting, I'm glad to do so. Uh, our, our delegation, I'm sure, has already spoken. We're all united working on behalf of the community here. Those questions are very important. It's very difficult to get the correct answers out to the public because there is so much misinformation in a lot of outside money on all of these things. Mm -hmm. We've all been subject to outside Americans. Mass Fiscal Alliance, they may have a headquarters in Massachusetts, but their, their main headquarters is in another state that has different campaign guideline laws than we have in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. So that's how they do these mailings. And, and you mentioned unions. Unions are only limited to $500 individually from the union to a yeah. campaign. They can form a PAC like other sides can form a PAC, but they still have to disclose that. Mm -hmm. And that's a big difference. This other money that they disclose after the fact so no one knows where it's coming from. And they can even, because they mentioned freedom of speech, they can even make up, make up a lie about somebody. And you've got to fight it after the fact to, to get the facts and the truth out there. So, um, And I am a very strong supporter of the nurses question, question one. I, I have three uh, relatives who are nurses. There is a lot of information. I've seen it firsthand. And I hate to use the analogy, but a truck driver is only allowed to drive so many hours on the road before they have to rest and so forth. A nurse is forced to work overtime, and then they're giving out meds. You don't want them to make a mistake on medications to our family relatives and right. so forth. And, and if they're first forced to work overtime, they're tired. And, and I've seen a first hand, and I know we all have. Emergency rooms are overburdened now. They're, they're, they're putting out threats that, oh, you're going to cause a disruption and all this stuff. It's a bunch of malarkey. Thank you. Um, yep. I've seen it first here. My nephew had to go to the emergency room at a local hospital, and they had people in beds in the hallway waiting right. to be this seen. Was, yeah. So yeah. there's not enough people now. Right. And there's some hospitals that abide by it. Mass General in Boston does a great job. They have a great level of ratio with staffing levels, but some of these other hospitals not. And they're even giving out literature to patients when they're coming in the door, nonprofit hospitals. And that could be a violation. Right. I mean, they're scaring the patients as they're walking into a hospital room. So, yeah. thank you for all you do. Thank you. Well, thank you again. Uh, this has been a, a wonderful forum. Thank Excellent. you for it's so informational. I, mm -hmm. I sit here and I learn just so much uh, listening to the two of you talk. Um, I want to thank uh, Representative Conan for being here in our presence uh, and for attending and uh, giving uh, us our, her time on her very busy schedule. Uh, I want to introduce uh, our president, Phyllis Ellis, who I'm sure will also <laughs> Stop shaking do, a remarkable, do a remarkable closing. <laughs> <laughs> president Ellis. Well, uh, uh, I want the opportunity uh, to introduce other members of the committee who are here right. uh, to show how um, <laughs> uh, well attended and how diverse our, our, our Absolutely. Uh, NAACP yeah. executive board is. So, uh, Ray, Ray, come on, Ray, come on. Yeah. we need diversity. <laughs> <laughs> That's me saying that. You don't have to I'll, I'll you can. I think it's not can. often that people <laughs> see the all the members of the uh, executive yeah, board. Cool. These are not all the members, <laughs> but these are just some of the members. this forum, so I want to really thank everyone for attending. I want to thank everyone for your help and your support. Vivette, you did a wonderful job. Thank yes. you very much. Yes, thank, thank you, you. Yes. and look out for thank our you. next thank event, you. which You're is welcome. our next event. Our next meeting is Monday, October 22nd. Our next event is October 20th. We have a WIN committee agenda right here. 
And what is win? Win is women in the NAACP. Amen. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Want me to do? Oh, yes. absolutely. Yes. Let us bow our heads. Father God, in the name of the Jesus that I serve, from Abraham to Jesus, we thank you for the bringing together of our leaders, the bringing together of our community. Lord, we leave here on one accord. Lord, we leave here with your blessings, and we leave here in the spirit of voting. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Amen.